we can get to your questions in the Q&A, inshallah. With that, I will introduce uh, Sheikha Maryam, who we are so honored to host today. Sheikha Maryam uh, Amir received her master's in education from UCLA. She holds a second bachelor's degree in Islamic studies through Al Azhar University. She has studied in Egypt, memorized the Quran, and has researched a variety of religious sciences ranging from the uh, Quranic exegesis, exegesis, Islamic jurisprudence, prophetic narration and commentary, women's rights within Islamic law, and more for the past 15 years, mashallah. She has been interviewed for her work by major news outlets, including BBC, NPR, and CBS. She is the creator of Varia, the Women or On Reciters app, which is available on Google Play and Apple stores for free or on www.varia.app, inshallah. We're so blessed to have Sheikh Maryam joining us today. Uh, inshallah, she'll be speaking for 20 minutes about uh, Surah Al-Kaf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, doing good. Much better now that I see your face and I'm excited to hear all the gems that you have to share with us today, inshallah. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. There is so much in the Quran about paradise and about the hereafter and about our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and building this relationship with him. And there is also a very specific and clear instruction that the shahada, that believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all that it entails, although perhaps it, the Quran doesn't explicitly say it in this way, but what we learn from the Quran is that the only um really the the only uh accepted the only acceptance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam especially for the hereafter when we think about someone whom we love when we think about someone who does not believe in Islam uh if you are a convert and you are the only muslim in your family if you are born and raised muslim and you have a family member who has left Islam if you have friends who are struggling with Islam oftentimes we think about our own hereafter, of course, but also the hereafter of the people whom we whom we are concerned for. And there's an ayah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, which we're going to discuss today, inshallah. And if we could bring up the ayah, please. This ayah is something that is a, a, a comfort for the Prophet them, but also a reminder where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَةً now, perhaps you, O Prophet وسلم, will grieve yourself to death over their denial if they continue to disbelieve in this message. We know that the Prophet وسلم, from the beginning of the message was first, of course, terrified by receiving the message because he didn't know what it meant to receive revelation from Angel Jibreel السلام, but then he was ordered to call people to Islam and he began with his own family. He began by calling his own loved ones to Allah. And then he spent every single day on this mission of helping other people see the beauty, the perfection, and the truth, the only truth of Islam. We know that the Prophet wasallam deeply grieved the passing of Abu Talib as he didn't accept Islam before he died. Knowing that even the Prophet Wasallam's own uncle who saw him, who supported him, who helped to protect him from the, 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 the worst types of abuse from the Quraysh, that he himself didn't believe it or didn't state the belief in the messenger of the Prophet, so the message of the Prophet Wasallam, is something very heavy. But it's also something that we see in the Quran for other prophets. And other people, righteous people who called to Allah. Think about Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam is calling his own son as he's in the boat. And the waves are, are, are so intense because of the flood. And he's saying, Irkab ma'ana. Just, just come on the boat. Come with us on the boat. Come with us on the boat. And his own son is telling him that he's going to stay on this, on this mountain. SubhanAllah, that it's going to protect him min al -ma from this water. We have the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. His own father not only didn't believe in him, he threw him into a fire 
a burning fire. Can we imagine what Ibrahim alayhi salam felt not only from the sadness of the relationship of a father and a son where your own father harms, abuses you in this way, but also doesn't believe in the message that you came with, doesn't believe you. So we see the juxtaposition of Ibrahim alayhi salam with his father, and then we see Nuh alayhi salam with his son. We see Lut alayhi salam with his wife. Subhanallah, we have a number of um, examples in every circumstance, like Asya alayhi salam and her abusive, tyrannical husband. And every single story that is shared in the Quran, we see ourselves. We see ourselves in so many different aspects of loss and of grief and of worry. And in this verse, uh, Sheikh Sha'arawi, in his tafsir of this ayah, he mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't, don't kill yourself over this intense amount of, of, of effort that you're putting into calling people. The intense amount of pain that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt because of the concern that he had for his ummah and the concern he had for the people around him. That level of concern is something we should all feel and we should all 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 make dua for the people that we love, our, our, our world around us. And also at the same time, there's a difference between that level of concern and having wisdom in the way that we interact with people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, out of his concern for the people that he loved, for out of his concern for his community and the world, he would cry Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he missed his brothers and of course his sisters. And the companions, they asked him, well, aren't we your brothers? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remind, shared with them that those were not his brothers, they're his companions. But the brothers, the sisters are those who are going to come in the future and never and never see him, but believe in him. That's us. It's not easy to believe in a prophet you've never seen. And of course, when you have the, the, the mentorship and the support and the, the clarity of a community who helps you see the truth of the message, when you read the Quran and you see the power of its words, and you know that there's no way, there is no way that anything could be the truth other than the Quran, subhanAllah, the powerful miracles of the Quran, the prophetic prophecies, the prophecies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even simply from a logistical standpoint, if it's just, excuse me, not logistical, intellectual standpoint, simply from an intellectual standpoint, take away all the ideas of feeling spirituality or just feeling the closeness, remove all of those emotions, simply from a logistical standpoint, it makes sense to worship God directly, to have no other partners with him, to believe that there's a continuity of prophets that came with books to give messages to people who didn't know how else to worship him. This all makes sense from us just simply from a, from a, from a, from a logical standpoint. And then add to that the fact that we have miracles from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Add to that the fact of the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the messages that the Quran calls you and the beauty in that relationship with Allah and the sweetness that you might taste once in a while in your relationship with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. But all of this is something that many of us take for granted if we haven't worked for it. And many of our beloved brothers and sisters are struggling with identifying as Muslim, and many of them have no longer identified, no longer identify as Muslim. And I want to share all of this with you to discuss our, our responsibility and our relationship and the way that we feel. And then inshallah, in the second lecture, we're going to be discussing a lot of the anxiety that comes with that and the way to help ourselves and others navigate that inshallah. So when we're looking at this ayah, and it's a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a comfort for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not to kill yourself over your, your sadness, your, your pain. It's a reminder for all of us too. I've had parents talk to me about their children because their children have come to them and told them that they no longer believe in Islam or they no longer want to identify as Muslim. Sometimes it's not as serious of an issue as leaving Islam. Sometimes it's a practice. For example, um, a, a sister wants to remove her hijab and her parents are so concerned about that. Sometimes a parent is um, concerned about the fact that their child has a boyfriend or a girlfriend. girlfriend. Of course, the idea of um, identification in terms of 
sex or gender or sexuality are all real issues that are constantly asked about today. A lot of times what I hear from young people on the other side who's not a parent, who's struggling with their parents, is that when they come to them with these questions, that they are threatened, that they that the love of the parent is um, is not this love that feels unconditional. It's very conditioned that they will only be loved if they do something specific, that they will only be loved if they practice in a particular way. If they remove their hijab, their parents will no longer love them. If they go out with someone of the same sex, that they will be kicked out of the house. These, these are very common. I hear these all the time. And I understand where the fear comes from for a parent. At the same time, or a loved one, or, or a friend, and at the same time, let's look at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we've talked about here, and I'm sure you've heard these stories so many times, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even for a man, Nu'ayman, radiallahu anhu, who used to play practical jokes on the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was such a fun figure amongst the companions, that when he drank, and he drank over and over he he and this is not just a private drink that no one knows about i mean the head for drinking is something that's public and when the companions were cursing him for this the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam attested in this person's love for allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and for me this moment is such a such a uh, such a lesson for all of us because none of us are with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam None of us have re received the mentorship of the Prophet them seen directly the miracles of the Prophet them with our own eyes. And we believe in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But, of course, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But sometimes when a person hasn't built that relationship with the Qur'an or with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when it's always been told to them, do this and do that because you have to, there's no explanation. It's simply the parenting style. Instead of the parenting style of, for example, positive discipline, which is a parenting style I heavily recommend, Positive discipline is a consequential parenting parenting style. For example, uh, your child forgets their jacket. It's very cold when they go to the park outside. Excuse me, not forgets their jacket. doesn't want to wear a jacket. They don't want to wear a jacket. And you're like, as a parent, you have to wear a jacket. It's so cold. It's so cold. They say, I don't want to wear a jacket. I'm not cold. And then they go out to the park and they realize, actually, it's really cold. I am really cold. The parent's reaction is not, see, I told you, or... Um, you know, a number of other things. It's simply, oh, you are cold? Oh, that's the consequence of not wearing a jacket. It's a consequential, it's a connect, the, the, the consequence is always connected to the issue so that the child is not being punished for a mistake that they make. They're simply experiencing the consequence of that action. It's always related. It's, I'm not going to take away your iPad if you don't clean up your room. What does your room have to do with your iPad? Those two things are unrelated. So positive discipline is all about making the consequences of our actions related. And why is that important? Because Islam is all about the natural consequences of our actions too. This is the message of the Quran over and over. SubhanAllah, being invested in the environment, being invested in our relationships with other people, Sulatul Rahim, like taking care of those relationships with our loved ones, all of those have natural consequences. So when we're looking at this parenting style, there's a book I recommend. It's called Positive Parenting in the Muslim Home. Positive Parenting in the Muslim Home. It's written by co-authors Noha ash and Munira Izzedine Lekovich. When we're looking at this parenting style in relationship to the idea of the belief system, that when a child comes and they say that they do not connect to the Quran and they don't even want to read it, where is that idea coming from? Is it because they're a bad child? Is it because they spend too much time on their phone? Is it because they are just influenced by the society around them? Well, all of those things are probably true in a sense that they, not, not the bad child one, obviously, um, in a sense that uh, we are influenced by our realities. Yes, of course. But at the same time, have we established a beautiful routine where our children feel connected to the Quran in a way that makes them feel seen and heard and nurtured? Or has our entire relationship with our children related to Qur'an just been, do your Qur'an homework. If you don't do your Qur'an homework, you don't get this and you don't get that. And it's just transactionary. The relationship part 
of our acts of worship is so important to help our loved ones, whether it's a child or a sibling or a friend. The relationship part is so important to help our loved ones and ourselves build an intimate, personal, vulnerable connection with acts of worship and a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why in this ayah, I think it's so hard. It's so hard to know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was so personable. He was so personal, sallallahu alayhi wa so compassionate, so merciful, so loving. And that compassion is the reason why so many companions became companions. They converted simply because of that, that, that interaction with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But even with all that, sometimes someone didn't believe. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's pain is palpable. The grief, you'd grieve yourself to death out of this, out of this pain. But the Prophet ﷺ was also the Prophet. And so when we are speaking to our loved ones, our care, our friends, our students, our, our cousins, or anyone today, remember, we make dua for them. And we be that compassionate mentor that the Prophet ﷺ was. And we humble ourselves enough to realize that we need guidance ourselves. That sometimes when we think, oh, I'm helping this person, I'm helping bring this person closer to Allah, maybe it's that person actually helping them, helping you come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we look at this, um, this feeling of worry, we need to sit and ask ourselves, what am I doing to help support this person in the process of coming back to Allah? Am I cutting them off from Allah by cutting them off from love and care from myself? Am I using religion if in a parental role or a caretaking role to manipulate someone vulnerable under my care to make them do what I want? Examples of that sound like, what's the point of your prayers anyway if you're going to displease me as a mother? Why would you go to the masjid if I'm just going to be angry with you? What's the point in the first place? Those statements, when we use those statements to control someone else's actions, how do we think that's going to impact the way that they feel about their relationship with Allah? When I got really into Islam, I spent a solid few years really thinking, I have now found the truth. I want everyone to know the truth. And I will be as harsh as possible if they're not following the truth. And let me tell you what that happened. Uh, what happened with, with that reaction? Absolutely everybody, everybody wanted to stop associating with me. I didn't bring anyone back to Islam. I pushed the few people, the, the people who I was one of the few people who was Muslim in their lives, I pushed them far away from Islam. The repercussions of that is something that took over a decade to continue to work on and rebuild. The trust that was lost took so much time to rebuild. But it took me time to realize that this perspective of this is the haq, and if you don't follow the haq, I'm worried about you going to hell and to follow the haq was something I had really heard in a lot of my own experiences in the Muslim community. It wasn't something I saw from my parents. It wasn't something I saw from my relatives. It was something I saw in a lot of Muslim majority spaces. Alhamdulillah that Celebrate Mercy is a beautiful example of teaching Islam with compassion and relevancy. But growing up 20 plus years ago before the internet was really around, I mean, obviously we had the internet, but online classes and online courses and all of this, we were very, very, very limited in what we were exposed to. And oftentimes that was the message. And so when we think about our role as people carrying this message as and as people who are trying our best to follow it, remember, it was the character of the Prophet وسلم, his compassion and his passion, which allowed people to see the beauty of Islam. Of course, logically as well, it makes sense. It's the truth. There's no other way. But also, also, how does someone believe in that? when the only interactions they've had with it is one of punishment and trauma and pain and shame and guilt. When that is all that someone has been taught to feel as a believer, how much longer before they simply say, I don't want this anymore. And that's, that's the message that I've received from so many, so many women who are, who are young women. Yes. But also women who are now in their thirties who are beginning to raise children and who don't know if they even want this path for their own kids. We don't have the power to change someone's heart. We are not responsible for anyone's happiness. 
We are not responsible for anyone's choices, but we certainly have the power to decide how we are going to interact with them in their lives and whether or not we're going to help that influence be one of support and being there. One, in making du'a for them, and two, in helping people realize that we will be there, inshallah, when they're ready to ask. That we will be there, inshallah, when they're ready to process. And I want to share with you just a closing point that anytime on my social media, whether it's on TikTok or on Instagram, when I've shared a video and I've had someone comment and say something like they left Islam, the, the, the responses are almost 100%. Who cares, you ex-Muslim? Stop being obsessed with Islam. Islam doesn't need you anyway. And every single time I've responded and I've, and I've said, if you're ever open to processing how you feel, please know that you can send me a message. And there has not been a single time where I haven't received a message. That person has always sent me a message. And I think that's so important because it means that even people who have left are open to sharing or asking or processing. But it's about how we are going to be as callers to Allah. And the Prophet wasallam was the most excellent example of someone who was there to listen, someone who was there to mentor, and someone who also allowed people to make their choices. And so we pray for ourselves foremost, first and foremost. The Prophet wasallam made the, the most frequent dua the Prophet wasallam made was, Ya muqallib al-qulub thabbit qalbi ala dinik. O turner of hearts, keep my heart firm. So we make dua for ourselves and we make dua for the people whom we care about, our society, our neighbors, our loved ones. And we try our best to be there as an example as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was someone who was full of compassion. Inshallah, we will see you soon. Inshallah, subhanakallah, we'll be happy to get you on the day that we come to it. Jazakallah khairan, uh, Sheikha Maryam, for that beautiful, beautiful reflection. Mashallah, I was so touched, I think. Um, a highlight of having you on our program is that you are so open and you are so vulnerable and uh, your own life experiences are, are a lesson for you to teach us through um, and reflecting on a lot of things that, you know, uh, other speakers or scholars might not uh, talk about as openly. So we really, really appreciate uh, your wisdom, mashallah. And if you would like to uh, follow Sheikha Maryam on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, you can find all uh, her handles here. And she's on TikTok too, mashallah. So you can uh, search her up and follow her. If you've enjoyed uh, the reflections on Sertal Cap so far, give this video a like so it's recommended to more people and subscribe and turn on the notification bell, inshallah, so you never miss a video from us anywhere informed.